However, we will be doing a school drive for the first few minutes of drive, the first 45 minutes of drive, and we will only be taking questions from the kids, but that doesn't mean that you stop sending through your questions as well. So, a very warm welcome to Parkway and Trentwood and Allington, Allington Elementary Schools. The kids are all six to seven years old, and they are all from Virginia Beach. It is wonderful to have you with us. I hope you kids are all really excited to go on a real life safari. So what you're seeing here is happening right now in Kenya and you're watching it as it happens. So we are all across on the eastern side of the African continent, which means for us, it's actually going into late afternoon, even though for you, your day has only just started. And it's a very, very hot here this afternoon. I think it must be close to, mm, I would say at least 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's really warm, very sweaty weather, and the cheetah are resting in the shade. There we go, look, there's ones looked up at us. Don't you think they look comfortable there in the soft green grass in the shade? I think they look very comfortable. I'm almost jealous of them. Oh, these three cheetahs are very special cheetah. It is a female called Malaika, and that means angel in the language here, which is Swahili. And she has two young boys with her. Now, her boys are almost grown-ups. I don't know if any of you have older brothers or older sisters that are almost about to leave home. Well, these two boys are almost, almost at the point where they are able to leave home and mom will be on her own once again. So they're going to be facing a very difficult time in their life up ahead. Now, because this is happening right here and right now, what that means for you is that you can actually ask us questions. So rack your brains and think of all kinds of exciting things that you've always wanted to know about African wildlife. And while you think about that, why don't you jump across to Rolf, who is also in Kenya, and find out what he's found for you. Thanks, Jamie, and hello, everybody, and welcome aboard once again for another Sunset Safari. We are coming to you live from Kenya, which is also in Africa, and we're just on the other side of the Mara River. You're watching Safari Live, and my name is Ralph Kirsten, and on the camera, I've got my trusty wingman, Archie. How's it, Archie? Now, welcome aboard. Also, for all the little kiddies uh, from all the different elementary schools, uh, please don't forget to send us your questions and your comments on the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and on the YouTube live chat because we'd love for you to be involved. And with all these animals around here, we'd love to know what you don't know or what you'd like to know about these animals. So what we hear right now in the nice hot African sun is a couple of black rhinoceros that are walking through the long grass. They've obviously both had a nice bath in the mud. They've been rolling around trying to cool off. Now, Jordan, you've asked a question, which is a very interesting one. How far are we f away from Virginia? Well, Jordan, we're in Africa, so you'd have to fly across across the Atlantic Ocean, uh, and, and then we would directly hit South America, I think somewhere around Panama or Mexico. Uh, I'm just trying to draw a line straight across, and then we'd have to go up north from there to get to North America. But you're probably looking at about two and a half to 3,000 miles, Jordan. Um, so it's quite a long way, but... Um, it's uh, uh, definitely still very hot with us here right now, and I think you guys are in your winter months as opposed to being in summer. So, And I know that you've had a lot of uh, storms recently, lots of snow.
Now, Sia, you want to know how big is the safari land? Well, here in the Maasai Mara, or the Greater Mara National Reserve, which is inside Kenya, it's about 30,000 square kilometers. Now, um, I'm just trying to think exactly how big. It's probably about as big as Virginia, uh, where you live. So the whole state of Virginia is probably more or less about the size of the of the Maasai Mara. And all of this has always been wild. There's no uh, tar roads inside here, uh, and the animals have been roaming free since the beginning of time. So it's very interesting that we can see um, a lot of wild animals, all the grasslands here, everything is totally free, totally wild, and these couple of black rhino, it looks like it might be a mommy and a daddy black rhino, but I'm not quite sure because it's quite far. Um, and we haven't been able to see exactly, but the one looks like a big daddy rhino, that one on the left hand side, and the one on the right looks like a mommy. But as I say, it's a little bit difficult from here to see, but straight behind those rhino and up off in the distance is where Jamie is with the cheetah. So she's, we can't see her from here, but uh, she's over there and um, what we're going to do now is I'm going to try and see if I can get a better view of these rhinoceros. But uh, while I do that, I'm going to send you straight on over the river to Jamie uh, with her spotted cats. How exciting is that? So you've got to see two different endangered species living wild in the place that they belong. Now, Ralph's already said that he's sent you down the river or across the river. Now, just to explain a little bit what that means, there is a really, really big river here that is called the Mara River and that's where all of the wildebeest cross <clears throat> when the great migration happens. Now I don't know if you've ever seen any, perhaps you've seen some videos of wildebeest crossing the river or coming through an area but lots and lots of wildebeest come through this area about once a year so I am across the big river away from where Rolf is. Now, of course there's also lots of little rivers here as well and where there's little rivers like this one then there's lots of big trees that will provide a perfect shade for our sleepy cheetahs. Now, not far away from here there's actually also a pride of lions sleeping in the shade so I'm going to take you a little bit later to go and see them but first I want to show you a really spectacular bird. Now, we've been sitting watching the cheetah and they're very very pretty but there you go have a look over there I know it's straight into the sun so it's quite difficult unfortunately this is the only place that we could be there we go but to the right there we go how cool is that bird Look at that. That is a saddle build stalk. So a saddle build stalk is a special, a very brightly colored type of bird. And this one is a male saddle build stalk. And I'm sorry, I missed the name there for the question about Kenya. I know we have a question about how big Kenya is. Ah, Sia. Now Sia is wondering about how large Kenya is and whether or not there are any cities here. <laughs> so Sia, Kenya is a little bit bigger than the state of Virginia and yes there are cities here there's some very big cities here so the capital city is Nairobi um, so Nairobi is probably about seven hours drive away from where we are now so Kenya is actually quite a big country and it's very very diverse in other words there's lots of different types of habitat there's places where it's very dry and there's places where there's big lakes and out here in the Mara there's lots and lots of rain every year. So there's a city called Nairobi, there's a city called Mombasa, there are lots of different cities out here. So yes, Kenya does indeed have a city. 
and takeaway and shopping malls <laughs> and all of those sorts of things that you would find in your average city. I hope one day you have a chance to come and visit Kenya. Our stork is currently enjoying the sun. He doesn't seem to need the shade as much as the cheetah do. Now you might be wondering how I can tell that it's a boy stork. You can just see the flaps underneath the beak. That tells us that it's a boy. Can you see those little yellow dangly bits underneath its beak? That is what tells you it's a male saddled stork. So very exciting. We've had cheetah, we've had rhino, we've had a saddle billed stork. Now I'm going to send you across to a country that is even bigger than Kenya to go and join James with some elephants. Hello everybody at the schools especially. It's wonderful to have you here with us in South Africa on foot if you can believe it and what we've got there are some elephants. Now please ask as many questions as you can. You can just send them through your teacher and she or he will ask us a question. And the biggest thing that I want you to understand about this is that we're walking here with elephants. This is a very special thing to be able to do. Now what I have here is a sock. Now, I'm sure many of you have lost socks before. Watch this. Can you see? This is ash. And what it's telling me is that the wind is blowing towards the elephants. And that means that they might be able to smell us. And they do not like the smell of human beings, elephants. So we need to be careful that they don't come too close to us. Now my name is James, it's taken me a while to tell you that, but that's just simply because I've had to keep looking around here and concentrating because you know what, there's another elephant. Senzo, who is on camera, is now going to show you the other elephant over here. There you go. Hello Jordan, you're not so much interested in elephants as you are in snow. You say, does it snow here in Africa? Well, Africa's very big, Jordan. It's much bigger than the United States. And you know, of course, that it doesn't snow, for example, in Florida very often. I think it did this year. But it doesn't snow there very often, but it will snow every year in Minnesota. Well, some parts of Africa, yes, it does snow in the very high parts, but most parts it doesn't. And here in South Africa, where we are, and there in Kenya, where you've met Jamie and Ralph, it does not snow. Kellum, you're interested in how hot it gets over here. Well, in this part of the world, Kellum, it can go up to about 105 degrees or so, which is really hot, but not very often. Uh, in the middle of the very hottest parts of our summer here, it probably goes to about 98 degrees regularly every single day. And where Jamie and Ralph are, Oh, a little bit cooler than that, probably about 90 to 95 or so, because they're much higher up. See, there's a little baby elephant there. Let's go along to this tree over here. Now, Jonah, you ask a very good question. You say, do elephants attack? Elephants don't attack just because they feel like being angry or because they are nasty creatures. They might attack if they feel like we are threatening them. Them. So the word threatening means basically if they feel that we are going to be nasty to them or we're going to hurt them, then they might try and attack us. But that's not happening now. I think they probably can see us, so we'll see what's happening here. And while we do that, we're going to send you across to possibly one of the most special things you can ever see in the wilderness, and that's a spotted cat. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Our trackers have been out in the middle of the day, and look what they have found. They have found Madame Tundi and her precious little one. They're just moving down a little bit. I'm going to try and get us around to where she is moving, so just stay with me. I am Noelle, and on camera today I have VM. Hello, Wildebeest. 
and we are just super chuffed at what is happening right now and I hope all of you are chuffed as well. Chuffed means happy, it means glad, it means just super enthusiastic about the whole thing. Now she's been resting in the shade a little bit and so I think she's just gonna move over and find another little piece of shade so we're just going to meander under here bypass everybody and have a look and see if we can get another little visual for you so just keep an eye over the top of my head for her there she is moving up the bank down the way it's a little bit thick in here but I'm gonna do my best to uh, to keep up and keep track I think I might just stop here for a second Vildi if you think maybe we can get a little bit of a view before I have to start doing some boondu bashing. Now for those of you that might be new with us, Tandi is one of our resident females, one of our territorial females. Her cub is about three months old. Tandi is about 11 years old. She's had several litters and this is her newest and she's been absent because of some issues with male leopards that keep popping up that really shouldn't be here. So the father of this cub, Tingana, this cub's a little bit too young for Tingana to be doing anything with. And then Hukumuri male's been in, and I know Tristan's been chatting with you about that new interloper. So now I think while we're busy meandering through this, which is a little bit thick, we're going to head over to one of the other presenters. Nikki, I'm so sorry I didn't hear who it was, but we're going to head over there, and I know you'll enjoy whatever they have as well. Hello everyone, my name's Scott, and we've just found a herd of elephants, and unlike James who's on foot, we can hopefully get a lot closer to them, because it's not nearly as dangerous once we are in the vehicle compared to being on foot. And I just want to get ahead of them, it seems like there's a big boy who's causing some trouble with all the ladies, and that's why they're moving around quite a bit, but we should be able to stop here and show you some good views of them. There we go. And I'm teamed up with Seb on camera this afternoon. He was just leveling the camera off there because we parked on a little bit of a bank. And what a wonderful afternoon safari we are all having. Well done to Noel for finding Tandy. I'm sure you're all very happy to see her and her tiny little cub. And I hope that Noel manages to keep up with her as she moves through that thick bush. Now you'll see that the elephants are quite wet and they're not sweating. Elephants can't sweat like we can but they've actually been throwing muddy water all over their body to keep cool, just like up in the Masai Mara. It's quite hot here in the Sabi Sands. And these guys have all been enjoying having a mud wallow. KL, you're wondering if all elephants like to use their trunks to pick things up. And yes, that is exactly what they use their very special nose for doing. And it's just the youngsters who sometimes take a little bit of time to get to know how to work their trunk that sometimes have to go down onto their knees to feed and drink. But once they're a couple of years old, those trunks become very, very useful tools. And would you believe it that these elephants can even pick up a tiny little peanut with their massive trunk? As you can see, they're moving by quite close to us. She's giving us the hairy eyeball. And I just need to make sure she's not nervous of us sometimes when elephants have young babies just like humans mothers will do anything to protect their young wonderful wonderful stuff now like i said elephants can't sweat but they do have very big ears and those big ears oh running after mom <laughs> but they do have big ears not for hearing but to cool their body down and the way they use their ears to cool their body down is that they've got very big veins that they can pump liters and liters of blood through every minute or gallons and gallons of blood and that helps to cool the blood off and keep the elephants cool and it's very important for elephants to keep cool because they eat so much food every single day they not like some of the other animals that eat plants their stomach doesn't do a very good job getting all the nutrients and vitamins from the food so they need to eat so much food every day and uh, an, an elephant like this one in front of us could eat as much as 300 pounds of salad every day hard to believe but very important the way that they do eat so much because they make sure that the bush doesn't become too thick and they essentially are 
the main gardeners that do all of the gardening of the African wilderness and they make sure that everything is trimmed and pruned and doesn't get too thick and out of control. Now, like I said, these elephants have been wallowing in the mud and my plans are to head to one of their favorite watering holes where maybe we'll actually be lucky enough to find another herd swimming. Sometimes you'll only just see the tip of their trunk poking out of the water like a little snorkel. And that's how they obviously breathe. It is just a long nose, that trunk, and we must remember that. And also imagine trying to imagine being an elephant and sucking water up into your nose and then blowing it into your mouth. That's how they drink. Thankfully, we don't have to drink like that because that would be a little bit tricky. Beautiful. Okay, well, just like Tundi moved off into some thick bush, so have these elephants. And I'm hoping, like I said, of heading back to or off to a waterhole where hopefully we'll be able to find you some more elephants out in the clearing. And it sounds like it's perfect timing because Tundi has just arrived into a good spot and Noel is right there to show it to you. She is in a good spot, thanks Scott, and she is panting because it's hot. It's it's interesting, it's not hot, hot, but it's super humid today. It was a really overcast this morning with a tiny little spitting of rain. Uh, not enough rain for us to have to put the roofs on for TV show, thank goodness. And I hope all of you enjoyed our live broadcast on Nat Geo Wild. It was our morning, but your evening. And uh, sorry to all the Patriots fans. I know my family that is still in New England is not impressed. But congrats to all the Eagles fans, as I hear it was a good game. Now I'm just waiting for this cuteness. Ooh, what does she see? What does she see? I wonder what she sees. I can't quite get a look at it. So Mason, hi sweetie, I'm gonna whisper my answer to you, okay? Mason, Tundi is a leopard. So leopards have something called rosettes, which are squiggly little, little dark marks with light marks in between. A cheetah has spots. Cheetahs are also taller and longer than a leopard. Now I've seen leopards in thick territory like this and I've seen them in open territory. And I've seen cheetahs in thick territory like this and I've seen them in open territory. Cheetahs tend to run after their prey to catch them. Leopards stalk. And something's caught her attention, Mason. She's moving a little bit differently. She's coming up the other side. Now I'm not quite sure, maybe the cub did something and moved around a little bit. But she has, uh, she's changed directions. So because she's changed directions, that actually means that I now need to change directions so we can keep up with her. I'm just gonna take away a little spider web. There we go, everybody. So a leopard's one of the big five animals. We get leopard, lion, elephant, buffalo, and rhino. So this is a leopard, and you've had rhino already in the Maasai Mara. Now, let's see if we can keep up with our leopard. And I think, while we're waiting, let's head up to Jamie, who has a cheetah, so that you all can see the difference between Tundi, who's a female chica, cheetah, and Malaika, who is, sorry, Tundi, a female leopard, <laughs> Malaika, female cheetah, sorry. <laughs> up with a Tundi, what an amazing opportunity to compare the differences between a leopard and a cheetah. So Noelle's already told you about the rosettes on a leopard. Now look at the solid spots on a cheetah. So that's one of the ways that you can tell the difference. And yes, cheetah are a little bit taller and a little bit skinnier. Now you can also look at their feet and they're giving you a really nice view there as the one cleans its paw just under its paw. You can see how they almost look like dog paws because you can just see the claws sticking out and that's because they are shaped very differently to a leopard or a lion and in fact cheetah only have semi retractable paws, claws. In other words, their claws are always sticking out slightly. So this sort of thing as they're grooming like this is 
often a sign that the animal's going to get up and move when you're looking at big cats, whether it's cheetah or lion or leopard. Oh, and there's one more difference that is I really shouldn't forget to tell you about. Look at the cheetah's face. See how they've got those dark lines running from the corner of the eye down to the nose? No other big cat has that out here. So that's one of the distinctive features that you can look at when you are trying to work out if you're looking at a cheetah. Or cheetah are shaped the way that they are. You want to know if cheetah can run for a long time. No, they can't. So most big cats can't run for a very long time, but cheetah are really short distance sprinters. In other words, they only really run on average between 300 to 500 or so yards when they're chasing an animal. But they run that really, 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 really quickly. So they are the fastest land mammal on the planet, but they can't run for very long. What that means is that they still have to sneak up on their prey. So they still have to stalk so that they can get close enough before they chase. Otherwise, the prey would have enough of a head start that even though the cheetah's much faster, they still wouldn't be able to catch up with it because the prey would just be able to keep running and the cheetah wouldn't be able to keep running as fast as it was. So that is why the cheetah has to stalk and that of course is why it has spots as well because it helps to camouflage the cheetah. So well done Ryan, that was a very good question because we're tying up all of the loose ends and we're learning how everything in nature is connected. Wow, speaking of a cheetah hunting and catching their food, Eli is wondering what do cheetahs like to eat? Well, Eli, it depends upon the cheetah, but you'll find that antelope form a big part of their diet. And the reason that I say it depends upon the cheetah is because a female cheetah, like Malaika, <coughs> hunts alone unless she's got some cubs with her like she does at the moment but a female cheetah hunts alone so she's only probably around about a hundred pounds so she has to go for some of the smaller antelope whereas with male cheetah they often hunt in groups called coalitions and they live in groups called coalitions and they're a little bit bigger than the female cheetah which means that they can target some of the bigger antelope so anything from a tiny antelope, and remember an antelope is kind of like the equivalent of a deer here in Africa. There's some things that are different, but that's basically what that is. And I'm sure if you ask nicely, one of us will show you an, an antelope. Now, Ladasha, here's an interesting thing. You've seen that leopard in South Africa. Now, leopards are very territorial, but Ladasha's wondering if a cheetah will fight with each other. And the answer is male cheetah do fight with each other, but usually female cheetah don't. And that's because female cheetah aren't really territorial. They move about a massive, massive area. And if they see another female cheetah, most of the time, they just walk in the opposite direction. So they're not social, but they don't really fight with each other. So it's the males who fight and the males usually end up fighting with each other because they're fighting over the right to mate with the female, whereas females don't. So cheetahs are actually quite peaceful creatures. Oh, good question, Cameron. Because I've told you it's maybe 500 yards, but now Cameron's wondering how many miles do they run in one day? straight away, then they're going to not have to run very far at all, because then they don't have to try again. But only round about mm, two out of the five hunts that they attempt will actually get them some food. So let's say they fail, maybe they fail three hunts and then manage to catch something else. Then you're probably looking at around about two miles, maybe three miles in one day if they don't get chased by lions. If they get chased by lions, then it might be even more than that.
But that is a very good question from there, Cameron. Now, as our cheetah slide further down into the shade, um, speaking of somebody who is capable of running many miles, I think you should go and see whether or not you can keep up with James on foot. That's a very clever link. Um, we're going along parallel, that means next to the elephants. They still don't know we're here, which is very important. And so we're just walking along a little dry riverbed here, next to which the elephants are the other side. Jordan, you want to know why elephants eat so much? Well, Jordan, do you eat as much as your father eats? I bet you don't. That's because your father's much bigger than you. And so the reason that elephants eat so much is because they're so very big. Anything that is big has to eat a lot. So the bigger the person is, or the bigger the animal is, the more it will eat. So you can imagine something as small as a, a mouse or a hamster eats much less than something as big as an elephant or a hippopotamus. And Sean Carter, you're asking in the same vein, how much does an elephant weigh? Well, a big bull elephant, that's a big male elephant, a big daddy elephant, can weigh about 16,000 pounds. Isn't that amazing? 16,000 pounds. And a big mummy elephant, probably around about 10,000 pounds. Now we're just going to walk a little bit faster down this path, see if we can't have a quick spot of these magnificent elephants, like grey ships floating through the green sea of the bush. Now, Sean, you're asking about how many elephants are normally in a family. Well, Sean, eh, normally only about between six and ten in this area, sometimes up to fifteen, and sometimes as many as thirty or forty, but normally that's a few families who've got together for a sort of party, I suppose you would say. All right, I haven't managed to find them again. We'll keep trying. While we do that, let's go back to that wonderful mother leopard and her cub. So Vildi and I have parked ourselves in a tree to get this a little glimpse of Tandi. You can see our beautiful foliage of this Cambritum tree around us. One of the trees that you'll find on this type of soil and small drainage lines. And it's a perfect place to create a nice little nook, a little habitat, a little niche, a little home for this leopardess. Now this female leopard and her baby are currently moving from place to place to place because there are male leopards around that she's not comfortable with. So female and male leopards both have territories, they both have specific homes. Like you, got, you kids, you go to school and you have your home and that's your territory. And you might have a place where you go and play sports, that's your territory. So leopards are the same. Then she's got a wider space called a home range that she'll venture to more outside and that would be the same as all of you. You might have a place where uh, you go and visit not all the time but from time to time but also a place where you feel comfortable. Now because her cub is little, it's only three months old, it's teeny teeny tiny, she sticks to her specific home area. Um, and she moves around as much as possible because the male leopards that are here are not supposed to be here. So there's a big male we call Hukumuri, and he's definitely not supposed to be here. And they had a, a slight bit of uh, contact the other day, and it made Tandi move just to the outer reaches of her home. And then Hukumuri moved away, thank goodness. And then the father of the cub, whose name is Tingana, he is not really welcome around this tiny little cub. The cub needs to be older because sometimes with tiny cubs like this, the males are not very nice to them. So she's trying very hard to stay away from them. She's also trying hard to stay away from other female leopards. Ooh, Asaya, good question. You wanna know how hot is it here on the hottest day of summer? So physically where I am right now, Asaya, in the greater Kruger area in Sabi Sands, one of our hottest days will probably be about 38 to 42 degrees Celsius, so about 115 degrees Fahrenheit. And now sometimes it's humid, but it's, it's more dry than humid. 
There are places in the states uh, that are much more humid. The northeast is very humid and down the east coast is very humid. We don't get that kind of humidity and it's nothing like Florida. If any of you are, have ever been to Florida, it's, that's very humid. It's nothing like that. But today is an odd day for us where it's not very hot but it is more humid than we're used to. So that's one of the reasons why she's panting like that. And also her belly looks a little bit full. So because her belly is a bit full, she doesn't sweat like we do. Like I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm perspiring a little bit because of the humidity. She doesn't have that ability to lose moisture through her skin. So she has to pant. She also has to pant to help digest what's inside of her belly. So she pants to cool down and she pants to digest her food. Listen, listen, listen. the baby. I hope you could all hear that. So, sorry Nikki, was it Kelly or Teddy? Teddy, you want to know how do we move so fast from place to place to show us the animals. So Teddy, I'm out here in a vehicle. Um, I also have James that's not far from me and he's on his feet. And then we've got Scott in a vehicle, but they're very close to me. So then we have far away from me, 1,600 miles away, we have um, Jamie and uh, Ralph up in the Maasai Mara. So we use the internet. We use the internet just like you guys are using the internet now. And we've got special signal that takes the signal from the camera on the back of my car all the way to London. And then it bounces back off of London and comes back into the Maasai Mara. Roughly, look, there's more to it. But that's how we're able to do it. So it's all of us coming to you on live camera, on, on live TV, as it were, using the internet. It's amazing, Teddy. So Teddy, when, when Wild Earth first started, when Safari Live first started, we didn't have this type of technology. Um, it's only because in the past sort of, I, what do you say, Vildi, like six years, five years, um, that the technology has gotten good enough for us to be able to do what we're doing. It's really incredible. Billy, I don't know if you want to show the kids what the back of our car looks like. So kids, if you want to see, so this is me sitting in the car. This is my little screen. There's cables that come out the back and they work through into where GM sits in the back. And then at the back of the vehicle, we have this antenna that sticks up. And that antenna off the back of the car, along with other fancy equipment, helps us to broadcast the signal out using basically internet. So while we're busy waiting for this cub to show up, let's head on over to Scott, who's on a vehicle. He's not too far from me, but just a few miles, and see what he's up to. Well, we found some other cute little babies, and these are baby geese, just waddling around and just like Tundi's cub, they are not alone. They need their mother's help. But unlike leopards, it's not just their mom who keeps an eye on them, but also their father. So mom and dad aren't too far away. There's one of them over there. And that's what those tiny little babies are going to turn into one day. There's another little bird in the foreground there. And we are at a very big water hole here. So there's lots of birds and lots of other animals moving around through this area. Beautiful. Now you may see some funny strange blobs in the water there. And those are hippopotamus. And hippos like to spend their days snoozing in the water. And all they do is keep their noses and their eyes out the water so that they can breathe and see and they can hold their breath for quite long, for two or three minutes. And if you try to hold your breath for two or three minutes, you'll realize that it's very, very difficult. There's one there just relaxing. And they relax during the day and head out at night to feed on grass. So that's what they're waiting for. Eli, you would like to know if there are any houses or people that live out here in the bush. And yes, there certainly are. The people that live out here are all people that work here because most people who come out here are coming out here on holiday to come on safari. So myself, for example, I live here, but lots of other people who, who work here and live here will be on holiday. And there's actually a lodge right here. And isn't that cool? 
Imagine if your house looked out onto this massive waterhole and the lucky people who come on holiday here get to see views from these little houses in the bush. But Eli, it does depend on what country in Africa you go to. There's still some countries where there are people who are not just coming on holiday to wild areas, but people that live out in the bush amongst wild animals. So that's quite interesting that there are still some places where people have to worry about leopards and lions stealing their sheep and their cows, but we don't have that problem here. Very good, it sounds like Tundi and her cub are in a good spot, so why don't you race back to Noel to get a good look. Kiddos, here's the little cub. Do you see how teeny tiny it is compared to Mum? And this is how leopard cubs get a bath from Mum. Look, she's getting in his, in her ear. It's a little female cub. And she's getting all the little bits off. It's also a way that she shows love. So cats like this do something called reaffirming a social bond. Humans do the same thing. So when you give your parents or your friends or your brother and sister a hug, that's reaffirming your bond that you have with each other. Now kids, I also want to say just how special this is. So I've been guiding for just over a decade and a cub this small is very rare to see, so this is very special. Ooh, Cameron, you're testing my, my file 13. Cameron, you want to know how many teeth a leopard has. Now, Cameron, once upon a time, I had that information at my fingertips, but I have filed it away in file 13, which is my, uh, my, backup, <laughs> my backup file. And I actually, off the top of my head right now, cannot think of the answer. So I'm thinking I'm going to throw that one out. I know we've got a few people in the Twitterverse and the YouTubeverse who possibly have that ability to, um, to answer that right at your fingertips because it's escaping me right now. Cameron, that is an excellent question. I can tell you something special about their teeth while we're talking about it. So when you chew your food, like if you're going to bite an apple, you bite the apple with your front teeth. Now, if you all feel your teeth, they're pretty square. And my teeth aren't very even, but some of you might have very even teeth. And then they're pretty square and pretty flat and thin in the front. And then you go to the back and you feel your molars. You feel how square and, and um, flat those are there. So we have teeth that are made for grinding down food. These animals have teeth for shredding food. So they don't use their front teeth to chew. They use their molars at the back. Feel your molars again. You feel how, how square they are. Now their molars have pointy parts that work like scissors. Oh, it's nursing. And those scissors allow them to grab the side of the food and chew. Now cheetahs have a similar teeth structure to a leopard, but their mouths are much smaller than a leopard's mouth. So we're going to send you up to Jamie, who knows a lot about cheetah. She spends a good time with them. So let's ask her about cheetah teeth. Oh, can you imagine how uncomfortable that must be for poor Tundi? Cannot be very comfortable at all. So while she growls and hisses at the cub, our cheetah are up and about moving through an area. Now, of course, we learn lots about animals every day, and we forget lots about animals every day. Um, I, one thing that I can remember just at the moment, I could so easily have forgotten it yet by tomorrow or possibly yesterday but the leopards have 30 teeth and interestingly so do cheetah so leopards and cheetah have 30 teeth now there we go oh, cheetah our oh, cheetah are moving off and unfortunately Fortunately for the kids joining us today, that means that it's time for us to say goodbye to you. You have to go back to class. I hope you had an amazing time on your live safari and that we'll see you again very soon with Tundi and her lovely cub. Nothing to do with you. You're bothering me. Go away. So she growled a little bit and hissed a little bit. So the cub's just gone to the backside. Now, where Vildi and I are parked at the moment is pretty much the only spot we have with a nice gap to, to see. So we're not really able to move around too much. We're sort of stuck. You can see I can barely <laughs> turn around. Dodgy. We're stuck in this tree on the side of a bank with one tiny little hole so that you all can view. So we're going to keep where we are now for this view. 
until they decide to move and then obviously we'll move and I think everyone will it will be quite happy with what we have at the moment. Now I'd be interested to know what everyone thought about our show that we had uh, this morning but it would have been last night for all of you. I, I'm pretty chuffed with the with the content that we got. It was sad that Tundi and Cub weren't there, but we're hoping for tomorrow morning for our second installment of our five-day binge series on Nat Geo Wild that she'll be around so that people can see her from across the United States. Many of you that are with us now are with us regularly on the YouTube. And then when we broadcast live from Nat Geo, we get to hit a whole bunch of other people who might not even knew what Safari Live was, and then they come and join us on YouTube every morning and every afternoon, hopefully thereafter. She meant she's hot. And don't forget, as well, we are live and interactive for anyone that might be new with us, so send through those questions, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or put them into the YouTube chat. We've talked about this before, so I'm just going to steer away from facts for a little bit. I, s I sit here, <laughs> I sit here with leopards like this, and she keeps glancing at us, and I'm always like, oh, she must just think like, oh, the humans, the safari paparazzi are here, oh, and then of course then she takes a nap. And viewers, thank you so much. You're saying the show was great, lots of content, lots of variety. I'm glad you guys enjoyed. Don't forget to tune in again tonight for all of you, but tomorrow morning for us. I have a feeling that the little cub is finding a little spot away. <laughs> Bobby, are you asking if other animals have belly buttons? Okay. All right, so yes, Bobby, that's what you're asking. Sorry, I just wanted to make sure that, um, that I had heard that correctly. Bobby, in all of my years of guiding, I have never been asked this question. So thank you for a new question. So Bobby, because leopards and elephants and hippo and wildebeest and a lot of the creatures that we show you out here are mammals. That means that they have an umbilical cord uh, connected to the placenta when they're inside the mum gestating and growing until they're big enough to come out. And so that means that the umbilical cord is attached to a place like our belly button. So I don't know if other mammals have a belly button like we do. I can tell, now I'm, I know some of you right now are touching your belly button because I want to touch my belly button, so I know some of you are touching your belly button. You might have an innie, you might have an outie, might be a little bit flat, uh, but that's where the umbilical cord was connected. So I'm pretty positive that where the umbilical cord's connected on something like a leopard would be similar. Maybe not the same, but similar, but we just don't necessarily see it because of the body structure that they have and also a lot of hair and fur. Now for something like a wildebeest or a giraffe or most of our hooved animals, the antelope species, you'll see that dried up umbilical cord there for a few weeks after birth, sometimes up to about two months depending on the species. I know with giraffe you can see it up to about two months. And where it's connected there's more of an Audi than an innie. Uh, from what I'm remembering. But then, when as I'm thinking about it now, as the umbilical cord falls off properly over the next several months, so when they're about four months old, three months old, you're not really going to see that, that little spot where the Audi is sort of disappears. So I guess it would be a flat, a flat one, maybe going into an innie. You know, we had Dr. Priya from the Columbus Zoo tweeting with us this morning, and because she deals with captive bred animals, we deal with wild animals, so we don't physically touch these animals. And when I was doing research, I was never even thinking of looking for a belly button. But I would be interested to know, with Dr. Priya, if she's ever had to look for a belly button. Just as a, a random thought. What a great question. I can see you all sitting there pondering, like, huh, belly buttons on a leopard. And now we're all thinking about belly buttons. Well done on that question. Well done. 
So I think that little leopard has moved away down the drainage line, but I also have a sneaky suspicion that it's probably climbed up a little bit and might actually be looking at us. This little female is getting to that stage where everything is going to be super interesting for her and she's going to be very, very, very curious. Now there's a couple of times when we look for Tundi and we find where she's been and the little cub will pop up and then if Tundi's not there, obviously we leave. But now that this little cub is older, a lot of the times what she does is she looks at us like, hey, I know you, I know what you're all about, I'm going to check you out. And she'll, she'll be doing that now. She'll also be investigating her surroundings quite a bit. Absolutely fantastic. Scott has saw, found, seen, he's seen, found something that we don't get to, to see very much. Um, and so I think we're going to head on over to him. Unless, Nikki, did I hear you wrong on that just now? Okay, perfect. Let's go over and see what he has to show us with the drone. Welcome back, everyone. And yes, like Noel says, we found an animal that we haven't been seeing too much of recently, the Cape Buffalo. And it's just a small herd of them. And isn't it wonderful that we've got these awesome toys that allow us a bird's eye view of these animals as they go about their business? Now, because we haven't had too many buffalo around recently, we're not too sure what they think of the drone. But for now, they seem quite relaxed. Seb has got the drone quite high above them, but it does make quite a big noise. So I'm happy to see that they don't seem too bothered by it. Sometimes certain animals will be a little bit scared of the drone, and we think it's because animals may mistake the drone for the similar sound of a swarm of bees. Our little car's also close to the water's edge on the other side of the buffalo. If you follow that trail that leads from the buffalo down to the water's edge, that's where we are parked. And isn't this cool? Very, very happy to hear that you guys got to see Tundi and her tiny little cub. And I hope you guys enjoyed that little flip. You can thank our French fighter pilot, Sebastian Rombi, for his fancy skills on the drone there. Now, my plan is to head away from the Chitwa waterhole and start heading back onto Juma to start searching that area for any sign of cats. But before we do that, let's zoom in and show you a closer look at this herd of buffalo. It's a mixed herd. There's a few big bulls. Both of the individuals on the far left are bulls. They've got a big crown of horn that meets on the center of their head, creating what is called a boss, and that's like a big helmet for them. Whereas that lady over there, you can see she doesn't have that big crown. A few of them actually there didn't, but let's try and keep an eye on her. She, oh, no, she's a bad option now because she's put her head behind the males. But the females don't have nearly as big of a kind of a crown on the center of their head as the males do, but both of them do have horns. Now, you may notice there's a few birds hopping around. Those are red-billed oxpeckers, and they're doing a very good job for the buffalo because they are snatching off little parasites called ticks, which are sucking the blood from these buffaloes. So these buffaloes are getting pampered while they go about eating their grass. Wonderful stuff. Like I said, we are going to head off, and so are you all the way back up to the Maasai Mara with Jamie. Unfortunately, things are not looking positive for us with Malaika. I think this is the first time I've ever seen said this in the time that I've been in the Mara, but she's almost at the boundary of our Traverse area. She is getting closer and closer to a conservancy where we are unfortunately not allowed to follow her. It would be most tragic for all concerned if that were to be the case. But of course, she is a female cheetah. She does have a massive home range. And that is, there is a certain inevitability to that. That's probably where she disappears off to when we don't see her for weeks at a time. It's astounding when I think of the times that we've spent with her. Look out hill, all the way through the Rongai Valley, Talek, up through Double Crossing, and then now all the way up here towards past Musiara Marsh and the ridge and towards the Conservancy. The amount of ground that these cheetah cover is simply astounding. Oh, there's some warthogs in the back. Let's see if she sees them. I know she did catch a baby warthog the other day. 
there to the left there, Adrian. They're just running across the top there. You'll actually be able to see some of the villages in the background. And they are... There they are. And you will see some cows as well, because we are right on, as I said, right at the boundary of the National Reserve. Trot, trot, trot goes the pig. Has she seen them? I don't see any youngsters. I don't think she's going to take on a two adult warthog. They're now coming straight towards her, though. Will she be able to resist the challenge? She still hasn't seen them. She's looking at something else, actually. So there are no fences. Oh, oh, panic, panic. They're not looking at Malika, though. They're panicking at something else. Still trotting towards her. Malika hasn't even noticed them, or if she has, she's ignoring them completely. No, next, not yet. Um, I, ca I can't actually reposition at the moment, unfortunately. Hold on one second. No. She's ignoring the warthogs completely. She's seen something else, but I think it's on the other side of this big river that's up ahead of us. Her two boys have spotted the warthogs. Now it's just a question of whether or not they, they're natural cat instinct is going to drive them to chase them or not I don't think so I think the warthog have made a lucky break for it why did we come all the way over here girl there's so much food back in the other direction I suppose there are lions back in the other direction but there are lions everywhere around here. I can't start the vehicle now, unfortunately. If I do, the warthogs will look up in this direction. Though we are straight between them and the cheetah, but the warthogs are far away. I don't think the boys are going to try it. It's a lot further than it looks through the eyes of the camera. I know. <laughs> it's the, the compression of the camera. It always makes these sorts of shots. It makes it look as though they're right on top of each other. But I promise they're actually quite far away. There's some cows in the background and a motorbike. Mr. Q-Tip, would the cheetah go for cows? Probably not. Um, would they be above going for a sheep or a goat? Mm, no, not necessarily. Um, so yes, the various livestock animals that live on the boundaries of the park do occasionally find themselves falling victim to the attentions of the big cats, or predators in general actually, not just the big cats, hyenas are included in that list. So it does happen. Um, where those animals have been killed outside of the park, where they of course are allowed to be, then those who own them are then compensated for the loss of that animal due to wild animal and that of course is to help to ensure the safety and security of the predators out here that's not to say unfortunately that it always works but it does go a long way towards mitigating the effects and there's a number of programs out here that seek to minimize the amount of human and predator conflict that does occur see she's just wandering off now okay let me try and reposition oh dear Oh dear, oh dear. Which way are you going? That way. Okay, this is quite uncharted territory for me. I don't even know if our signal's going to last around here. So while I pluck my way through and figure out where we're going, let's go back across to Rolf, who has got a bird that could hardly be described as beautiful.
Yes, well, that's another one of those faces that only a mother could love. Um, we have been on the lookout for lions. We've been charging around, trying to look at all the usual spots, but we haven't been able to see any. But what we have found is um, something that follows lions around sometimes. Uh, marabou storks, they can be um, often found near to predators whether it be lions, um, even leopards, sometimes, mostly lions um, and hyenas. And these birds are also found near rubbish dumps and abattoirs uh, because they do eat carrion. So anywhere where there is an opportunity for scavenging, well, they'll be in the vicinity. So this is the first sort of clue that I've had that there might be some lions around but it's not necessarily that uh, uh, there is a lion in, the, in this uh, near vicinity. I just need to double check because uh, there is a marabou stalk so there, there might be a chance but uh, for now I haven't seen any lions just yet. But he's sitting nicely on the top of that shepherd's tree and it's making for a nice uh, setting and so I'm going to continue on my search for the lions and I'm not going to stop until I find some and while I do that let's head you on back to South Africa and Scott's got some swimming elephants I don't know if my earpiece is cool welcome back everyone we've got ourselves into an awesome position here and We've got a herd of elephants, a large herd of elephants, and it's a herd of elephants that a lot of you will know because there's a certain individual called Fang in and amongst this herd. I can't see her right now, and Seb is busy focusing on flying the drone. There's a beautiful big bull who's nice and close to us. He is in must, which is a sexually heightened stage where there's a lot of testosterone pumping through his body, so they can be a little bit naughty. And there you can see the nice big bull quite close to our vehicle. And they've literally all just arrived at the water's edge. There's one individual that's actually taking a swim. And there you can see it splashing around in the water. How cool is that? And what an epic scene. Enjoying itself. I'm hoping all the others do the same thing because it'll be wonderful to see a number of elephants taking a bath. It's funny how sometimes only one will and others, the other times the whole herd will join in on the fun. And where is Fang hiding? We call her Fang because one of her tusks is kind of inverted. It grows the opposite direction to what it should. So she's very easy to tell apart from other elephants. And I'm not sure when last Fang was actually seen. So like I said, I'm sure a lot of you will be happy to know that she's back in the area. She's probably one of the only elephants we've really got to know quite well because like I said, she is quite easy to tell apart from the others. Well, they've just let off quite a loud trumpet. So I'm wondering if they're having a little bit of a into her dispute. Oh, there's another one going into the water. Woohoo! So not just one wanted to have a swim today. And look at how much bigger the bull is than the rest of the elephants in that herd. He looks almost twice the size. And he's not the only bull on the scene. There's another one that is kind of sneaking up behind us. But it's going to be tricky for us to show him to you from the main cam. But from the drone, we will be able to show him to you. He, unlike the big bull that we saw earlier, is not in must. So we don't have to be too worried about him doing anything mischievous. Okay. Well, what a wonderful scene this is and our plans clearly changed. I was hoping on leaving here and going and searching for other things, but our plans were quite pleasantly changed by this herd of elephants who came charging in through the bushes to this big water hole. And there you can see Fang, the individual right in the center of your screen. And you'll notice how her 
tusk is growing the wrong way, and it doesn't seem to be giving her any trouble. She can still use it to break off branches, and she's just grown up and got used to it. Oh, there's another one holding on to the end of it, a little baby. I don't know if you guys saw that. You can also see the one that went for a swim. That's the dark one right in front of Fang at the moment. And I wonder if it's one of Fang's older youngsters, because it was quite close to her. Ah, oh, hello, Fang. Good to see you again. Oh, my heart just skipped three beats because a young elephant bull is the one that was responsible for going brrr behind us like that. And it looks like he wants to show us how big and strong he is. But quite often with the young bulls, they kind of act like they're big and strong. But just like this one at the last moment, they decide, oh, maybe this wasn't a good idea. And then they end off running up to the rest of the herd which is exactly what's happening here. Well, wonderful, wonderful stuff. You'll notice we've plonked a roof on our vehicle since you were last on it. So we were just collecting that from after this morning where James left a chair. Well, it looks like they're all coming straight past us. I think we're gonna get lucky with some wonderful, wonderful views. Sinak, you'd like to know how many elephants and young babies are in this herd of elephants. And let's count. I mean, I guess young is uh, a term that can vary on one's opinions. But to me, it looks like there's one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, five youngish ones between kind of naught and three years of age. So a mixed batch and... I'm actually not too aware of the exact workings of this herd and how big it is. There's another portion of elephants kind of further away from them that also might be a part of the herd that have just kind of temporarily split up. Now, what also may be happening with this herd of elephants is that there could well be a female that's coming into season and that's why there's that massive, massive bull that you can see who's approaching them now. And more often than not, elephant bulls will only hang around herds when A, they are in must, which this individual is, but there could well be a female that is coming into season and that's what is causing him to want to hang around this area in the hope that he gets lucky. Beautiful stuff. It's so cool how the drone really gives you a good idea of how much bigger he is than the females in the herd. And the males can be up to two tons the size, or two tons bigger than a female. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. Well, that little rebel that's just crossed onto the island is the same individual that had a swim. Anyway, we're going to race you off to James on foot with a dragonfly. We are looking at a dragonfly whose name I'm afraid I'm just quickly trying to see if I can find. It's this beautiful pale ice blue colour. And I've seen hundreds of other dragonflies from South Africa and none of them are. Ah, there he is. I think he is known as a black-tailed skimmer. Has he got a black tail? Yes, he does. That is a black-tailed skimmer, everybody. You may have the mm, zoological name if you want. Neschiothermus farinosa. Neschiothermus farinosa, or the common blacktail, or the black-tailed skimmer. Very nice indeed. Now he's sitting just next to a pan here. And obviously he's been hunting things like mosquito larvae. I wish he'd eat all of the mosquito larvae in this area. Malaria, a tremendous problem around here, especially in the wet season. Now, do you see how he's perched on a branch that is angled at around 45 degrees? This is because his front, middle and back legs are not on the same plane. So the front legs are substantially shorter than the middle legs, which in turn are substantially shorter than the back legs, because he's got six legs, being an insect. And what happens is they form a basket as he flies and he catches these larvae with the basket formed by his leg. So he'll dive down towards the water and Taurus, you're wondering if they're carnivorous. They are indeed. He'll dive down toward the water, 
and sort of scoop out a mosquito larva and then devour it on the wing. And so those legs, while very good for perching, are also especially good for catching beastly, beastly mosquito larvae. Those of you who don't know what a mosquito larva is, well, it's the initial form of a mosquito. It's in the same way as a maggot is to a fly or a caterpillar is to a butterfly, so a mosquito larva is to a mosquito. And that's what these dragonflies like to eat. Now they look quite similar in many respects to something like a damselfly. And a damselfly many of you will be familiar with because they do occur in I think just about everywhere in the world. They've got much less firm movements and their wings are not nearly as stiff as these ones. They sort of float about the place whereas dragonfly flies like a particularly accurate fighter. And when do you say wow this is amazing? It is amazing. And it's an amazing colour to find in amongst the sort of browns and greens. And now Dale, you want to know where dragonflies lay their eggs. They lay their eggs in the same place that they catch their mosquito larvae, in standing water. And it is an astonishing process, the mating process and the laying egg laying process. And for those of you who have heard this before, just bear with me. But what happens is the male, and I'm just trying to see if this is a male. You can see from the back, no, this looks like a female. The male has got two pincers at the, at the end of his abdomen. And what he does, if the, let's pretend that's the female, which I think she is. Whoops, there she goes, she'll come back. There we are. He'll fly behind her and then grab her behind the head. They often come back to the same perch. Grab her behind the head with the two pincers on the abdomen. And then he'll fly off, sort of holding her behind the back of the neck. She will then fold her abdomen underneath his and receive his sperm. And the eggs will be fertilized. And... I think it happens, in fact, during the same nuptial flight. The pair of them will dip down towards the water, and she will then just dip her abdomen on the water's surface, and the eggs will float down to the bottom of the water, and the, her larvae will hatch there, and they will eat, I think they eat algae and things like that. Senzo is doing a spectacular job of looking at this black-tailed skimmer. Just fantastic. Megan, you want to know what would eat this dragonfly? I suppose any of the hawking birds, so uh, perhaps a fork-tailed drongo, perhaps a... I'm trying to think of something a little quicker in the air than a fork-tailed. fork tailed drongo is pretty quick. I guess some of the swallow species might eat one of these. Definitely a woodland kingfisher could get hold of one. They would definitely... Um, I suspect also that you would find big lizards like perhaps the, um, what am I thinking of, not girdled lizards, the other ones, um, plated lizards would probably have a go at them. You might even find something as uh, like a large stripe-bellied lizard would also have a go. Well, I think that's magnificent. Our elephants, for those of you interested, headed off towards the north. We had a very nice sighting of them, uh, but they were just in thick bush all the time, pretty much. OK, we're going to head back down towards Twin Dam, see what we can find there. While we do that, let's go back to Noel and the Lepard. So Tundi can't quite figure out what she wants to do. She was lying on her left side, then her right side, then her left side, then her right side. So now she's sitting up. And it has dropped a few degrees in temperature, and the humidity has gone away, not totally, but a little bit. So she's still panting, but not as heavily. The temperature is getting a little bit better. Listen, listen. She was making quiet little calls to the cub. Do you hear them? She's not doing a very loud one. They're very, very quiet. 
the bird you could hear calling quite tactically in the back. Oh, sorry, everyone. Um, the bird you could hear calling quite tactically in the background there was a, a gray hornbill. It's one of my favorite calls in the bush. Listen, listen. She's ready to get going. I think she wants to move soon. I also think that she's just checking to see where the cub is. a yawn. So before predators move, they yawn, they yawn, they stretch. There's the cub coming up the back. Oh, bath time again. Reaffirming of that social bond again. Cubs trying to nurse again. Did you notice that that little snarl there? The minute the cub goes for the teeth, she's like, "Oh, I really, I just can't." She's very sore. That cub has very sharp teeth. Philip, excellent question. You want to know if we'll be here with Tundine overnight? Philip, we have in this area a curfew for the reserve for everybody that is on the reserve, and it has to deal with anti-poaching. Uh, maneuvers and so no we will not be staying with Tundi overnight um, we will be leaving her sort of shortly after show wraps and then picking up in the same area again tomorrow morning uh, we don't want to do anything to um, affect uh, the anti-poaching teams that are out here for one um, and and then for two as well, Tundi and Cub, as much as we want her on TV show tomorrow, they also need to be able to have a little bit of their own space in these thick vegetations because the Cub is so little. Um, if they were older and we didn't have curfew, um, possibly a different scenario. If we didn't have curfew at all, even at this age, also possibly a different scenario, but we have what we have and we're given what we're given and you know there's de sort of definitive reasons behind that. Um, and so I think I think we'll be good and we'll find her tomorrow. Now from one cute little cub to another cute little cub, we are going to head up to a different species that I really, really enjoy seeing the youngsters of and so does Ralph. Yes, thank you Noel. And um, well everyone, we've just come here next to the hyena den and well we've got lots of these little youngsters now that are pretty much saying hello to me over here and they're being very inquisitive, lots of action and there was all sorts of chattering going on a minute ago, a little bit of cackling and but it's amazing how these little cubs have grown when we first came here a couple of weeks ago, well it's, it's almost over a month ago now uh, those little ones that are sort of getting the light colored heads they were all very dark very small and look at them they're already doing very sort of um, dominance displays with that tail going up and that, that also happens when hyenas get around food or when they're having a real uh, tiff then that tail goes very straight and points up but it's fascinating how fast they've actually grown this one coming over again, I think very inquisitive, making as if it's going to come all the way across to us over here. But very nice to have these little youngsters. Now Megan, you want to know if they'll chew on my car. Megan, I'm not going to let them because we don't want them getting into that habit. So if they start to make as if they're going to or they start doing that I'm just going to bang on the side of the vehicle just to not frighten them but just to make them a little bit cautious of us and go back maybe a little bit towards the den it's nice to have them very curious and coming up to the vehicle but we don't want them too relaxed about around vehicles because they eventually you know they've got such strong jaws and very sharp teeth that if they start biting on your vehicle uh, it can very often 
result in them chewing on your tires. And as I've said a few times before, look there, there's a little fight. Ooh, that's a bit of a family tiff going on there. He's gone straight back down the hole. Now, Elissa, yes, they are very close to us. We're probably, uh, you know, within 10 meters or so of the of the den, about 15 yards. But they are pretty used to the vehicles here because the Michigan State University uh, do a lot of research on the on the, on the on the hyenas here, and they've actually been uh, researching these hyenas for the past 10 years uh, in the Mara Triangle on the other side of the river in the Greater Mara Reserve. They've been doing it for about 30 three years so um, but here in particular they come here quite regularly and um, uh, these hyena are very used to the vehicles so it's not a problem but we don't want them getting too comfortable especially with chewing on the vehicle now look there's there's all sorts of little greeting ceremonies going on there um, and I remember there is a lot of sort of sniffing of the genital areas and and that's where they sort of working out the dominance or where they are in the hierarchy um, lots of sniffing and and tactile communication as well going on with them and that one a little bit older probably heading uh, to around a year or so um, and also going up to about 18 months now these beautiful hyena for me are one of the best animals around i love it here at the hyena den and it's one of my favorite spots but uh, I, I think i'm going to stay here a little bit longer with these spotted hyenas and speaking of spotted animals let's head you on down to south africa with noel and the leopards All right, everyone tundi has allowed her little one to nurse and we usually do a moment of silence with sort of bird calls and scenery, but I think let's do our moment of silence with this uber cuteness and just really enjoy it while we have it. Oh, that was absolutely fantastic. I hope you all enjoyed it. Now, Nikki, I believe Ali was asking about the new male leopards in the area or the male leopards in general, and do they know if Tundi and Cub are here? Oh, yeah, for sure, Ali, for sure. Um, Tundi does know that there's a new male in the area. She came into contact with him, not as far as I know, face to face, but Tristan had her, had Hukumuri. Uh, salivating and wandering around looking for what we thought was Hasana and then <clears throat> later on uh, bumped into Tundi and Cub and Tundi was completely frantic so yeah she's aware that's why she's over here in the corners we were chatting it a little bit earlier on on game drive and it's a theme that will will keep coming up again and again so it's a good question to keep asking but yes she's she is definitely aware Tingana is not aware he hasn't been over here in a while although he might be making his way the side he left Chitwa and went north into Torchwood yesterday so it's possible that he might come and realize that Hukumuri was around and sent marking in places that he really shouldn't uh, but Hukumuri has also moved off now. Hukumuri has moved west. I believe he's over by Simbambili. Um, so he might decide that this is part of his or he might just carry on. Uh, sorry, Nikki. Gary's asking, it, will she be upset with other cats around? Will she hunt? So, Gary, you're asking, will she hunt with other cats so close around? Gary, of course, she needs to eat. But the first thing she's going to do is move her cub away. There's always going to be other cats in the area. So she's obviously concerned about lions being in the area. She doesn't want to be killed by lions, and she doesn't want her cubs to be killed by lions. Um, new males coming in, of course, she's going to have a concern there, but she still needs to live her life. So she does what a leopard does best, which is to go and hide. Um, and and move and move away, um, but she's yeah you know, she's not going to move out of her core territory unless she's being actively pursued by that male, and she hasn't been actively 
completely pursued by him. So she's getting, life is normal, life is carrying on. We've just been having a little bit harder time finding her because of the areas she's choosing. It's very difficult for us to get the vehicles in. It's also difficult to get in on foot. And as well as the fact that she's, that cub's not in full denning mode anymore. So she's not going to be in one place for long. Uh, like she was when the cub was younger than three months and she was fully denning. So that's why it's been a little bit harder with, with finding her. But she's definitely eating. She's taking care of the cub. She's good. She's she's doing her thing. All right, now that mom has fed a cub, she's going to take another little nap. And cub will take a nap with that food full full belly. So I think let's head back on up to the Maasai Mara to our other cubs, the hyenas. Now what it's so amazing actually we've got all the spots today uh, with with the cheetah over that side and with us here on the spotted hyena well that's absolutely fantastic and i just want to let everybody know that jamie has had to head on back home uh, she's got her relief crew taking over because we've got the big show happening in the morning again and um, jamie has got a very long drive back so she's made her way back already and so we won't be crossing back to her but uh, well we've still got these very cute little guys to watch for the time being but I'm I'm sure that Jamie is going to catch up with Malika again in the morning so that will be very exciting for everybody so tune in but let's continue with these little guys who are being very curious and uh, I think you guys know my voice by now don't you hey little one but don't chew on my tire hey Psst. yeah naughty don't go so close, otherwise I'm going to have to back out of here. Now, Joy, you want to know how the hierarchy of um, the hyenas work. Now, it's quite intricate. It's very political. Well, let's just watch there a little bit. Even with the, the small little youngsters, uh, it's very clear that the political system of hyena is such that you're born into your position uh, within that system. So uh, if your mom is a highly ranked female, well, you're going to be born into that. And normally the firstborn would be taking her exact position. And you can have siblicide with hyena, because, especially with the highly ranked uh, females. So uh, that little sibling doesn't want to share that position with the with its uh, younger brother or sister um, and so it, it, it can literally kill it. But remember with hyenas also is that the females are all, all of them, not some of them, all of them are more highly ranked than all of the males. So even the lowest ranked female is ranked higher than the highest ranked male and um, the males generally are never seen anywhere around the den site uh, they are pretty much banished to uh, be skulking around the edges and the the territories of hyenas can be massive so the males are actually left to be almost nomadic they will be chased away from the uh, their den or, or their, their clan that they got born with or they'll move on on their own and try to find some, some other hyenas that they can potentially uh, try to we weasel their way in but um, the males really uh, shame in the hyenas world uh, really quite uh, nondescript and, and nowhere within the hierarchy so the females really sit uh, much higher and then, uh, as I say, it's 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 almost like a, a kingdom, but it 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 would be obviously a queendom or whatever you would call it. Uh, what is the what is the uh, um, when you have a queen? It's not a queendom, is it? What is it? Now 
Now, Tamora, you also want to know, um, how do hyenas smell? Well, Tamora, they, they do that with their very strong nose that they have. And obviously, you can also see their very big ears. And um, they're almost like little satellite dishes. Hey, guys, don't chew on my tires. Um, so very big ears and very, very good sense of smell. So those are the two senses that hyenas use the most. And... Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm just going to try and get these little guys out from underneath the vehicle um, and then uh, I think we might be moving on soon. But while I do that, let's head you on down to James who's on foot with a very interesting jumpy thing. I am on foot with a very, very interesting jumpy thing and I think you can probably see it there. It's called a jumping spider. There it is. And as you know, I always like to find a spider because to say the word spider sends shivers up people's spines. You know what? This thing's caught something. That's why it looks like it's got so many legs. It's carrying a victim. It has murdered some hapless creature on this tree and it is now carrying it around, sucking it dry. Unless it's carrying a baby. No, it's eaten whatever it is. But I think it's also eaten another spider. That wouldn't be unusual. How fantastic. Not if you're the fly or the other spider, of course. Can you see it, Senzo? Magnificent. Very, very difficult to get something this tiny on camera. I'll point it out to you. It's only about five millimeters long that's about a fifth of an inch can you see it there and it is definitely carrying the corpse of another spider which it has devoured that is very cool indeed now while you look at the spider I'm going to give you a small advertisement you must please play Safari Bingo with us during our TV shows. We have four of them left going out at 10 o'clock Eastern Time on Nat Geo Wild. You can go to natgeo.com forward slash Safari Live to learn the rules for Safari Bingo. And most excitingly, you can win a trip for two to Kenya or South Africa with Nat Geo Journeys. And that will be a spectacular, spectacular thing for you to do. So that's natgeo.com forward slash Safari Live, and I'll announce the winner on Thursday evening during the show. So it's 10 p.m. Eastern time on Nat Geo Wild. I think he does have green eyes, you know. Anyway, I'm not sure what kind of jumping spider it is. There are hundreds of different sorts of jumping spiders that you find around here. All of them belong to the same family, but there are lots of different genera and even more species of these jumping spiders and you know spiders are some of the most poorly understood organisms in the world hmm. and our strawhead they are completely aware of us strawhead you make a very good point you say you love the way they move about they seem like they're aware of us well they've got superb eyes of all the spiders I think they have by far the best eyes because they have to be able to judge distance so a little bit like you and I and most primates and most birds are pretty good at judging distance uh, through sort of 3d perception so the spider has to be able to do exactly the same thing and it does that, of course, by having some kind of binocular vision, which is probably not nearly as complicated as ours, but what it allows you to do, or what it allows them to do, is judge the distance between it and its prey so that it can jump accurately. Really very spectacular indeed. There seems to be a game drive coming along with the number of howling children on the car. Anyway... I suppose the howling indicates that they're having a good time. So if you do hear them, that's what's going on there. Then I just wanted to point out very quickly a flower over here, which I have not seen a lot of this year. And I like this flower because it reminds me of a village where I used to work, which is not too far from here, called Justitia. And it's right on the boundary of the Sabi Sands, and I did quite a lot of research in that area. And this flower here is called Justitia. 
but unfortunately it is not flowering. At the moment it produces beautiful yellow flowers. Isn't that nice? Gorgeous. <laughs> so, Sid, you're wondering what I think the animals of today would look like in 50,000 years. Well, Sid, if conditions where we are now were to remain the same for the next 50,000 years, what you'd find is that they probably wouldn't change at all. Uh, the thing that drives evolutionary change or the um, absorption of an evolutionary mutation into a population is a change in the environment. So let's pretend that it got a lot drier here over the next 50,000 years or so. Well, then the environment is going to select for animals that are better able to cope with desert situations. Things like Stienbock, you'd probably get much smaller antelope in here. The elephants, let's pretend that the same, num the same species lived in the area, you'd probably find that evolution would favour smaller body size. You'd find that things like um, uh, everything would probably get slightly smaller because of course then they need to eat or drink less water. Uh, you'll find that the grass species will change quite a lot. They won't get nearly as long as this. The vegetation would become a lot more scrubby. So it's very difficult to say, but it's really nice to think about that kind of thing. You know, how would things change in the next 50,000 years? 50,000 years is not very long. Uh, maybe sort of a million would be a uh, more obvious evolutionary time. Let's head across to Jamie. She's got dogs eating. Okay, I can't linger for too long, and Ralph's already said goodbye on my behalf, but I just had to show you something amazing that we found on our way home. It's a jackal kill, and it looks like it was a young antelope, so I'm afraid for sensitive viewers this might be a little bit difficult to watch. Luckily, the young antelope is dead, so it's no longer suffering, it's no longer in pain. I think it's a baby impala. It's just such a fascinating example of jackal behavior. We always think of them as scavengers, we always see them on the outskirts of lion kills. And now look at this. They've managed to catch themselves. I presume it was them, otherwise I think any larger predators would still be here. They've managed to catch themselves an antelope. This is the second, yes it is, it's a young impala. It's the second jackal hunt that we've seen, one was with a scrub hair, and now we've got the two of them feasting on a little baby impala. Bad luck for the impala, but an absolute boon for these two jackal. Hold on. I can hear hyena off to the right. This is very close to where Brent was this morning with the five male cheetah. Maybe there was a, a chase and the, fe the cheetah caught a female impala and the jackal managed to capitalize on the youngster. Okay, let me go forward just a little bit, just to get us from out from behind these bushes. You can hear hyena just off to the right here. Here we go. Let me just listen for a little bit longer. And then, very strangely, they're... they're, they're To the right, there. Very strangely, there's an adult impala feeding not too far away from them, perfectly relaxed. There you go, a fascinating, fascinating sighting to share with you on my way home. We still have to race um, to start heading back on time. But I just wanted to show you this, a pair of black-backed jackal, proving that they're not just scavengers, they are able and skilled hunters when the opportunity presents itself. Amazing. I just wanted to share that with you very quickly. Um, before we continue our race towards the gate, let us send you back across to Noel, who's had...